not recommended by the National Science Foundation and may not be suitable for college graduates. <clears throat> Pay attention now. This is a test. This is only a test. Ready? Begin. If sound doesn't travel in a vacuum, how come a vacuum cleaner makes so much noise? How come you never see any baby pigeons in the city? Is there a hidden dimension beyond our own where misplaced socks, lighters, pens, and caps of pens reside? If you think you know the answers to these and other science questions, then join us now for the Ask Dr. Science official National Science Test. It's time once again to ask Dr. Science. So let's ask Dr. Science. That's me. Remember, he knows more than you do. I have a master's degree. In science. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm Rodney, Dr. Science's research assistant. You know, we receive thousands of science questions every day. But science is more than questions. Oh, much more than that. Much, much more. But science takes work. And brains, and determination, and guts. And determination. I already said that. So let's put it this way. There's a thin line between ignorance and arrogance. I have managed to erase that line. But can America erase that line? We want to like America. But we can't, unless we know who America is. That's where you come in. We asked our computer, the Frugendas Fact Finder 2000, to find the most commonly asked questions in your letters. These questions form the basis of the Ask Dr. Science official National Science Test. A demographically perfect sample, selected for their ignorance and enthusiasm, will be taking the test with you. Rodney, let's meet our home contestants now, shall we? Right, Dr. Science. First, from Last Picture Show Texas, an unemployed blender repairman, E. Buzz Robertson. I'm ready. A housewife from Orange County, California, Mrs. Albert D. Clummer. Do you have any prizes on your show? Finally, from Denver, Colorado, Dr. Carl Poindexter. It's a privilege and a pleasure to share my education with you. I should do quite well. Thank you, contestants. And what about you? What are you doing? Well, you should have received the Ask Dr. Science official National Science Test home kit in the mail some weeks ago. This kit contains the transparent test grid, the patented Dr. Science test marker, the test error eradicator, and the test booklet. Simply place the transparent grid over your television screen. Mark the proper answers. The results will be tabulated as we go along on the Fugendas Fact Finder 2000. If you didn't receive these materials, pay close attention and mark your answers on a standard sheet of 8.5 by 11 yellow college ruled note paper. No holes in the left-hand margin are permitted. Use a sharp uh, number two pencil. Raise your hand at any time during the test if you wish to leave the room. No talking or your test will automatically be marked a failure. Use check marks only. No X's or dots. No writing outside the margin. Uh, turn the page when you hear the command. Obey all instructions. Have fun. Markers ready? Let's go. Oh, our examination covers several categories, facets, aspects, categories, if you will. These include wonders of nature, small, furry, creepy things, slimy vegetables, and fungus. Our first question comes from the amazing world of high technology. Uh, what is Bolivia's chief export? Rodney, that's from the National Geography Test. Oh, right, I have a lot of different pieces of paper here. It's hard to keep them straight. Our first question is uh, multiple choice. How do they put sound in movies? A, with sledgehammer and wedges. B, with a special paste. C, ventriloquism. D, with lots of money. Mark your answers, and let's see how you're doing. Contestants? Bauxite. Door number three. Actually, none of the above. The digital recording has replaced animal. And the correct answer is... C. Ventriloquism. Let's see how it's done. There is no such thing as sound in a sound movie. What we call sound is the responsibility of this man, Mr. Dolby. 
A gifted mimic, the omnipresent Mr. Dolby, has provided sound effects and voices for virtually every Hollywood film since 1937. Have we got a good one today? All usual turkey. <laughs> Only recently has he received official recognition for his incredible talents. Well, I'm ready. Coming soon! Ba, 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 ba. Only Bella Lugosi could live. Oh, 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 oh. Only Sylvester Stallone could play. Ah! Bella Lugosi. Ba, ba, ba. What will happen when Mr. Dolby retires is anybody's guess. My bet is that we'll go back to the good old days of the silent screen, and Willie and Gish will become a big star again. <laughs> I hope you home viewers did better than our contestants. Nobody got that one right. Our next question is an easy one from the category we call liquids and solids. Why does every magazine you buy have those little cards in them? A, they are courtesy bookmarks. B, they are how magazines procreate. C, save them and collect valuable prizes. D, they are passports to another dimension. Mark your answer. And the correct answer is... Why do magazines have those little cards in them? B, because that's how magazines procreate. It's obvious when you think about it. Let's take a look at my garden. This is the Dr. Science Horticultural Research Facility, located near the heart of downtown Los Angeles. We asked our resident botanist, Fritz, to select a magazine at random from a local newsstand. This is magazine C. We're going to use this test patch here to show you what happens when we plant this seed. Doesn't really matter where you plant these fellas. Just cover them loosely with soil. Add a little bit of water. Sit back and wait. Somewhat like the potato, the magazine seed germinates beneath the soil. <laughs> Now, be careful when you harvest your magazines. If you only leave them in one or two weeks, uh, you end up with something underfed and skinny, like a real estate guide, for instance. <laughs> and a compost heap. For a healthy, full-grown magazine, add plenty of manure and allow four to six weeks for delivery. <sighs> Be sure you don't leave them in the ground too long. This kind of neglect could leave you with rotten vegetables and bad reading habits. After a year in the ground, you could end up with <sighs> a Russian novel. I can't read this. There's too many characters. I guess I'll just have to start over with this one. <sighs> Another compost heap. Dr. Science, Many people accuse you of answering questions that have nothing to do with science. The only limits that exist in science, Rodney, are limits that exist in our own minds. I am an artist. My palate is the world. One day I might answer a question about potato salad. The next day, a question about quarks. You see, science is homogenous, just like milk, only different. <laughs> well, you know, our next question is a variation on that same theme. Fill in the blank. It is possible today to create life in the blank. Contestants? Toolbox. Kitchen, Bob. Life in the kitchen. Now, that question is not specific enough to answer properly. And you cut me off last time. I was about to explain. And the correct answer is, it is possible today to create life in the... <laughs> bathtub. You should have gotten that one. Now, here's Dr. Science to show you how. What we have here is a perfectly ordinary piece of white bread. Take it with you the next time you shower or bathe. Drain the tub and place the piece of bread in the tub. In three months' time, you'll end up with this. In six months' time, you'll end up with this. 
And if you can remain patient for a year or so, and don't mind bathing with an artificial life form, you'll end up with this. Many people don't realize that every time you bathe, you lose thousands of DNA cells. These cells become trapped in the drain, and when combined with certain generic brands of hair conditioners, combined result in a primitive clone. Though undeveloped, this clone can be taught to obey certain simple commands, such as sit, roll over, and even kill. <laughs> Lighten up, Rodney. We're only kidding. Okay, Junior, back to the top. And now, Rodney, what's our next question? Uh, well, Doc, Doc, Dr. Science, uh, it's time for our viewing audience to guess the identity of tonight's mystery scientist. And here's our first series of clues. As a child, our mystery scientist soon achieved notoriety as the most sullen boy in New Mexico. None of that changed when he won a blue ribbon at the Truth or Consequences New Mexico Science Fair in December 1955 with a rather sketchy monograph on planaria. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. <laughs> our scientists might be a mystery, but there are no mysteries in science. No, if the answer doesn't seem right, ask another question. Everything's the answer to something. Rodney, next question. Our next question comes from the Mysteries of the Universe file. If you are traveling in a faster-than-light vehicle, what happens when you turn on the headlights? A, the highway patrol will pull you over. B, your headlights will chase you down the road. C, it depends on the make and year of the car. D, life as we know it will end. And the correct answer? What happens if you're traveling in a faster-than-light vehicle and you turn on the headlights? Let's take a spin and see, shall we? Looks like a perfectly ordinary bicycle, doesn't it? Well, actually, the spokes are made out of a titanium alloy that acts as a cyclotron, turning even the heaviest of metals into the rarest of gases. Is it a 10-speed, Dr. Science? Rodney, don't be ridiculous. This bicycle has 57 gears. Wow! Hop on! And we're going to need each and every one of these gears if we're going to accelerate from zero to 186,000 miles a second. Your legs will get pretty tired. Let me worry about that, Rodney. Buckle up. Okay, here we go. Now, thanks to the miracle of computer-generated 3D holography, we're going to see just what happens when a vehicle breaks the light barrier. Are we going kind of fast? That's the idea. is a painful process, painful to watch and painful to undergo. So to spare you this, let's take a look at our next set of mystery scientist questions, and we'll see you back in the lab. Dr. Science, wasn't, wasn't that... <laughs> and now your second set of mystery scientist clues. At the age of 25, our mystery scientist finally graduated from high school after an unsuccessful attempt to create a synthetic chicken broth. Our mystery scientist received his B.S. in advanced condescension from an unnamed Midwestern university in 1965. You'll receive one more series of clues to our mystery scientist, but now, here's an easy one for you. How come you never see baby pigeons in the city? A. Pigeon condos don't allow children. B. Pigeons prefer to give birth in the country. C. Baby pigeons are always kept in the hospital for observation. Or D. The baby pigeons are hiding. How come you never see baby pigeons in the city? D, the baby pigeons are hiding. Let's find out why. Many of us have owned a pet parakeet as a child. Well, sometimes we forget to close the cage, and when that happens, the parakeet escapes into the cold and lonely city. There they meet with other refugees of the urban night, rats. Parakeets mate with rats. Out of fear and loneliness, I suppose, as in most intimate contact, the result of this mating is the pigeon. Baby pigeons hide out of shame, emerging only as adults to coo, waddle, and steal your french fries. I like to watch animals mating, and I'm sure you do too. And since this is public television, we can show you these things. So let's take a look at this most unnatural sex act now, shall we? Uh, Rodney, where's the parakeet? Um, it escaped. Well, where's the, where's the rat? Maybe it picked the lock and got away. It was a pretty smart rat. 
Rodney, where's the baby pigeon? I couldn't find one. What do you mean you couldn't find one? Well, I checked every statue in the city. I couldn't find one. What do you want a baby pigeon for, anyway? Because I was going to show the whole process here. Parakeet plus rat equals baby pigeon. A parakeet mating with a rat? Yuck! Yuck! Rodney, there is no yuck in science. No, evolution has been an inescapable, if messy, part of our lives ever since Darwin took his famous voyage with the beagle. Darwin took a trip with his dog? Oh, just read the next question, Rodney. From the category called Life's Little Mysteries, what happens to the other sock when we unload the dryer? A, it wanders away. B, demons take it. C, it's an optical illusion. D, it enters the Bermuda Triangle. What happens to the other sock when we unload the dryer? B, demons take it. And here's how it happens. Tiny bubbles, the come clean center, laundry land. They have many names, but they all mean the same thing. Gateway to hell. We placed a hidden camera inside this jumbo dryer to capture the culprit demon in this unique videotape. What our sock thief didn't know was that our ordinary looking washer person with the dirty clothes was in reality a private detective hired at great personal expense. We asked our man to turn his back deliberately on his socks. Let's see that again in slow motion. a hidden dimension. <laughs> Home of pens, socks, caps of pens, lighters, they're all here. What the forces of evil do with these things is not the job of science to find out. We just discover the truth. The rest is up to you. From the category called Small Furry Creepy Things, our next question is a matter of concern for many Americans. What is the last thing to go through an insect's mind before it crashes into your car windshield? Well, this is far too complex a question for mere multiple choice. Consider your answer very carefully as you watch the following experiment. To answer this question required some very creative experimentation. <laughs> First of all, we had to find a way to record those final thoughts. Rodney. This is the South American barking beetle, Wrigglum's disgustus, <laughs> native to the Argentine and possesses a rudimentary form of ESP. We attach diodes to the exoskeleton of the psychic beetle. This laboratory has been converted to simulate the driving conditions along a lonely stretch of Kansas highway in August. This piece of plexiglass was selected for its superficial resemblance to the windshield of a 1956 Studebaker. This box, which science calls the big box of bugs, holds our test subjects. For a cruising speed, we picked 50 miles per hour, which coincidentally is just about as fast as Rodney here can throw. All right, Rodney, I think we're ready. Wait a minute. Don't ever do this at home. OK, we're ready. <laughs> Our psychic beetle has picked up the final thoughts, and they're being tabulated right now on the Frugendas Fact Finder 2000. And here are the final thoughts in descending order of frequency. Whoa, big and shiny. Hey, watch where you're going. Uh-oh. And death, where is thy sting? Oh, that must have been the praying mantis. Don't be ashamed if you didn't get these same results. Remember, most people don't own a psychic beetle. And our final question comes from the amazing world of high technology. How do photocopy machines work? 
A, divine intervention. B, cloning. C, photosynthesis. D, 186,000 miles per second. Contestants. I'm just gonna go with C, but I'm just probably wrong. Who are your sponsors anyway? I am going to report you people to the FCC, the AMA, the Scientific American. I have a PhD, and I want you off the air! How do photocopy machines work? A. Divine intervention. Let's go back to ancient Greece. The first copy machine was actually a human being, a Greek philosopher named Xeroxes, who, it is said, was gifted by the gods with a strong flashing light that emanated from his midsection. Whether a manifestation of Xeroxes' kundalini energy or ki or a bizarre mutation, we don't know. But we do know that ancient clerks began to place parchments against his solar plexus. A few moments later, an identical copy of the manuscript would appear. Unfortunately, teenagers and artists soon abused Xeroxy's power by placing their faces against his stomach. Today, sophisticated machines have been developed that mimic Xeroxy's natural abilities. But few people know how to use these machines properly. Often, the machine shuts down with no warning and displays what is commonly known as the jam indicator light. Many people don't realize that the jam indicator symbol is actually Greek for sacrifice required. A small goat, sheep, or rooster is ideal, but the SPCA doesn't approve. You can use anything near and dear to you. Your mantra, call key operator, uttered over and over in a monotone, and your personal sacrifices should bring Xeroxes from Mount Olympus. Just remember that a little bit of faith always helps when it comes to duplication. <laughs> and now for our final set of Mystery Scientist Clues. Our Mystery Scientist finally received his master's degree in either 1970 or 1974 from an unnamed university somewhere in the Midwest. He spent the next few years doing what he describes as a lot of stuff. These don't seem like the right sort of clues, Dr. Just Sarah. keep reading, Rodney. Finally, in 1980, with the help of his devoted research assistant, he legally changed his first name to doctor to lend more credence to his amazing store of knowledge. His hobbies are science, sarcasm, and television. <laughs> Contestants. <laughs> I don't know, and I don't care. You don't have a big wheel? You don't have a lightning round? What kind of game show is this? I can't believe you are putting this kind of misinformation onto the television. I am going to call up the station right now. I'm Enough of this. I can't stand the suspense, Rodney. Open that envelope and let's find out who this amazing scientist really is. All right, Dr. Science, it's you. Me? What a surprise. I better check the data. Later, Rodney. Enough about me. Let's find out how America did on the Ask Dr. Science official national science test. Right, Doctor. Even as we speak, the results are being tabulated on the Frugendas Fact Finder 2000. Our test was monitored by the Federal Bureau of Tests and Measurements, an organization unaffiliated in any way with any government agency. The results, Doctor. Aren't we forgetting something, Rodney? Oh, right. Now you can play the Ask Dr. Science official national science test game at home. For a nominal fee, we'll rush the home version to you. It's as easy to learn as it is fun to play. Each of our contestants received the home game as our way of saying thanks for taking the test. What test? This made it all worthwhile. Liars! Liars! You people don't deserve a TV show! And here are the results from the Frugendas Fact Finder 2000. And how did our contestants do? 0.1%. 
If we allow bauxite is the correct answer to the first incorrect question. But America, how did America do? 68.5%. 68.5%. Well, that's almost a passing grade. Almost a passing grade. Almost. I guess America ought to be ashamed. America is ashamed, and so am I. Ashamed, disgusted, drained, hungry, and yet hopeful. Hopeful that what we've done here tonight has started a little fire in the back of America's brain. A fire that'll burn a tunnel from the medulla oblongata to the prefrontal cortex. Yes, I'm envisioning an America with a hole in its head. A hole that'll put ignorance and apathy to rest forever. Good work, America. Ignorance is bliss, and tonight, you're a happy nation. If you love your IQ, let it go. If it loves you, it'll come back. If it doesn't, it was never yours to begin with. Yes, tonight, Dr. Science is a dreamer who dares to dream a different kind of dream. Good night, America, wherever you are. Good night.